Hello my fellow gamers and going medieval fans. This is the first part of my village design video series. The idea behind these videos is that you'll learn how to plan out your game and future village design from the settlement setup menu all the way to the end game. I'm going to talk about the importance of knowing what you want your village to look like before you even start a new game, as well as how to work towards that goal once you start playing. As there are a number of game modes, maps and difficulty levels, each video will focus more on one side of the spectrum, while I will sprinkle in general tips like special room bonuses, villager specialization, combat, aesthetics, walking speed, stockpiles, mood modifiers and many more tips and tricks. I'm going to start with showing you my own 3 totally different village designs, in 3 different maps, 3 different game modes and 3 different settler setups, meaning 3, 6 and 10 settlers, all with different primary and secondary skills. For simplicity's sake, I will refer to these villagers as the hilly, valley and mountain village. Alright, so this is the one from the standard game mode with 3 starting settlers on a hilly map. You will recognize it from my first video guides on going medieval, but if you don't, then I would advise following the links up here and in the description to watch those videos first. This view is from the second year and what is instantly noticeable is that the entire village is actually one major structure with many rooms and levels, spanning from the third underground level to the third above ground level, so six levels in total. The villager skills were primarily picked for botany, intellect, construction and cooking, while the secondary skills were tailoring, smithing and combat skills. Current number of settlers is 7, with the newest villagers adding more skills like mining, extra smithing and combat skills. Verticality is one of the main aspects of this design. Lower levels are basements followed by dining rooms for easy access to food and which will become a great hole later on. If you need a guide on building the best basement for food preservation, you should check out the video linked up here and in the description. Above those basements are crafting stations for building materials and food production stations which need to be enclosed to become special rooms with special production bonuses. A kitchen should always be close to your food stockpiles so that time isn't wasted in hauling raw ingredients to the kitchen and cooked meals back to the basement food stockpiles. Take note that a smokehouse does not count as a kitchen element. What this all means is that if you are going vertical, like I did in this village, you should build a kitchen right above a basement, right next door to a dining room or a great hall. Or incorporate the dining room into the food basement, but you won't get the positive mood modifier done, unless the rooms are separated by a door. The big square room is currently a warehouse, a temple and a distillery all rolled into one. But these should be separated out into special rooms as time goes by and resources are available to get more special room bonuses. I'm pretty sure praying while high on distillery fumes has been known to produce, uh, let's just say, less than favorable results. Above this is the workshop which has several workbenches and workstations and I will go into more what it takes for each room to get special bonuses later in the video. But what is important to point out on this level is job specific stockpiles next to each workstation. You don't really need big stockpiles for a single workstation. For example, the tailor needs a large quantity of linens or leather for an apparel, but that doesn't take more than one or two tiles. Same with the stonemason's bench and other workshop benches. The villagers themselves won't mind standing knee deep in resources or items so you can cover the entire floor of the workshop with specialized stockpiles. As we go up another level, we find the shared bedrooms and the libraries. Shared bedrooms give positive mood modifiers, but single bedrooms give even stronger positive mood modifiers. That means single bedrooms are more preferable, but they also require more resources, so it's not something you should rush for, rather plan for the future. Which is exactly what this part of the building is for. It's a rough outline of future single bedrooms. The libraries don't require much just a research table and some bookshelves for that extra efficiency bonus. I think, as probably every going medieval player does, that we need proper bookshelves for chronicles and other textbooks. I think this is one of the most demanded features and I hope developers are already working on making them happen in the next content update. Now about the defenses. As this playthrough is on the standard mode, I used to use just this spot here as a lookout and an archer's nest. The stairs funneled the attackers into one line and after being shot by the archers, the melee fighters would finish off the bandits. The winter cold snap made me wall off this area to be able to heat it up. So because of that, this overhang here is to be extended and made into a new archer's nest and funnel for melee fighters. 
The traps also help a lot with slowing down attackers and inflicting both injuries and wounds. Spreading them around the pad to your defensive position is the most optimal placement. They do have to be reset after each use and that takes time from the villager's schedule. One very important note is that the enemy AI is programmed to go after your villagers, so you can choose where to fight simply by placing your villagers at the location of your choice. This makes setting up ambushes and traps much easier. But there is an important caveat to this. If your workstations are exposed, easily accessible and not behind walls or doors, raiders will go after them trying to bait you out if you are behind closed doors. This is why, to be able to choose the battlefield, you first have to wall off your workbenches or accept their loss. One problem in this plan are the trebuchets, the siege equipment raiders sometimes bring with them. Some call them catapults. There is a major difference between those, but it's not the subject of this video, so let's not get bogged down in siege equipment specifics. Anyway, trebuchets or catapults, however you call them, have long range and will break down your buildings and defenses. I will dedicate a whole video to this subject in the future. The trick to dealing with these siege weapons is to know the fact that traders assigned to crew them will stop what they are doing if you send your villagers close to them. So you have to be aggressive and an offense becomes the best defense in this situation. Once they stop using the siege weapons, you can even pull back your villagers and bring the enemies closer to your walls if you have archers set up there to shoot at them. Now we can actually see just how much this game is in need of a proper gatehouse, drawbridge and a moat. A moat you can dig, but with no water or for example crocs to fill it with, it's not nearly as fun or impressive. Now it's time to change the scenery and go into the mountains. This playthrough is from my peaceful game with 10 starting settlers which were specifically picked for mining skills for the most part, with some settlers picked for specific necessary skills like smithing, tailoring, intellectual, medicine, marksman for hunting. The mining skill comes most in handy here because of several factors. First of all, there aren't that many trees on the mountain map, so you cannot plan on building much with wood. Even if you wanted to plant forests to grow and harvest them for wood, there is a lack of fertile land for that plant to work out. But what is plentiful on a mountain map is a limestone, iron and gold. The latter two are used for item crafting, but limestone is a building material and some items like walls don't even require processed bricks at the stonemason's bench. Before you do that, however, you need to realize that tiles, or to call them pillars, have much higher HP depending on the material they are mostly made of. So on a mountain map, it takes quite a bit more work to dig and mine these tiles than it does on a valley map and its dirt clay tiles. When you put all of these nuggets of information together, you come to the realization that mountain maps offer a unique opportunity to make underground villages. Villages where most of the rooms will be under one, two or even six layers of limestone and other materials. In the process of digging them out, you will mine out so much raw limestone, iron and gold that you will never need to mine for those materials again. What is important to know is how the stability mechanic works and what are the maximum room sizes and in which configuration of wooden beam supports. This topic I covered extensively in my previous video, linked up here and below. And if you have been enjoying this one, please consider hitting that thumbs up button, sharing your ideas for village design in the comments and subscribing if you haven't already to see the next part of this series. Now let's look at these mined out rooms and check out their specialized stats. First up, the kitchen. Here we have a butcher's table, two hearts and two wall shelves with pottery. In this combination of items, that makes a spare room into a kitchen. Do note, one heart is enough, I have two to speed up pickling and meal preparation. Next up is the workshop. This room became specialized after the addition of two shelves with tools and a production workstation. These are many. The exact list is Armorer's Stable, Boyer's Stable, Blacksmith's Forge, Woodwork or Stonemason's Bench, Smelting Furnace or Sewing Station. Again you see specialized stockpiles right next to the Sewing Station and the Stonemason's Bench in this room for easy access of raw materials and delivery of finished items. The last production room is the Brewery Room, but the game doesn't yet have a specific room for this, so unfortunately no production bonus. A cool, or perhaps a more appropriate word, warm thing about this setup is that you can really heat up the underground rooms if you use heat production workstations inside of them. The temperature will spike to 25 degrees midwinter. This is why I have separated out all the rooms by doors and hallways so they don't end up heating up the basement where the food is kept cool and fresh. You can notice another example of a dining room placed 
right in the food basement. There is currently an issue in the game where if the food stockpile is far away from tables and chairs, villagers will eat standing up, wasting the opportunity to gain a positive mood modifier from eating at a table. This is part developer issue, part player design issue, so it will take a few more patches to iron it out. As this is a peaceful playthrough, there is no need for planning out defensive positions, placing traps or making forts. Even if wolves attack, just arm your villagers and you will get through it with minimum scrapes and bruises. Currently, my settlers are sleeping in shared bedrooms made out of wood, but my plan is to turn the mountain into an underground great hall more like a throne room, with hallways leading to bed chambers, kitchens, food basements, dungeons, temples and so on. Yes, temples are a thing, but dungeons still not. We'll talk to developers about that one. Temples also require specialized setups of shrines, wall hangings and shelves. Do not mix the shrines. What making an underground village provides is a stable temperature for the villagers, because outside you are at the mercy of cold snaps and heat waves, but inside, with proper insulation, with clay or dirt wall pillars and conservative use of floor tiles, you essentially always have the same temperature, except as previously explained in rooms with workbenches which produce heat. So far we have seen a hilly village with a single major structure dug into a hill, and an underground village made in a mined out mountain. Now it's time to check out the village in the heart of a valley. This playthrough is in the survival mode with 6 starting villagers rolled and re-rolled until each had good combat skills and production specific skills and perks. In the end, I settled for a melee tailor with several good secondary skills, a melee smith with low secondary skills like mining, a melee carpenter and builder, a hybrid melee marksman botanist with green thumb, another hybrid, this one intellectual, and a cook who can wield more than a kitchen knife in a fight. As with the other showcases of villages, I have more than the starting settlers, because as days passed, events happened and I got opportunities to take on more villagers. There are multiple ways to get more villagers in this game and I have already made a video in which I explained all of them linked up here and below. As I mentioned before, raiders go after the villagers, so in this valley village I have designed a small wooden keep to act as my final stand against the first few raider attacks. It is built on two levels with a clear line of sight for my archers and a choke point for my melee villagers. Traps are set up at the entrance staircase and there is plenty of room for the next expansion and additional defensive structures. The plan is to have a tall wooden keep at the center, high limestone walls around it, which can be traveled to only from inside of the middle keep. This way archers on the walls can shoot at enemies climbing up the middle keep from all sides while they cannot be attacked themselves, at least not until enemy archers arrive. Then different tactics have to be employed. This kind of a defensive tactic means you do not have to spend copious amounts of time and resources to build walls and towers around your entire village. You just make a small fort from which you fight off attackers. As for the siege weapons, I have already explained that a few minutes ago and I will do so again in a special video on combat. When it comes to the rest of the village, its design called for separate specialized multi-story buildings. One is on the ground level, another has an upper floor, while the third one has two floors. The fourth building will likely be about four or five stories high with separate bedrooms for each villager where the top levels will be for gold, weapons and book storage, kinda like a real village main keep. The first and shallow basement is right below the village, but another level is in the process of excavation to move the food further down should the need arise or should I decide to have an underground great hall for drinking, eating and all around lolly lagging. Rooms are being walled off and specialized as resources and time allows. There are already two workshops and a library set up in the biggest building, with a kitchen and more workshops soon to follow. The bedroom is a very large and shared one, so I am already running low on space for additional beds. Again, you will notice specialized stockpiles right next to or below workstations. This facilitates speeding up production and reduces time spent hauling items and resources. Sticks are an easy material to find and you will stockpile a lot of them as you cut down trees. They can be made into flooring tiles, but they do have a less optimal walking speed stat. Yes, indeed, this game does have different moving speeds for settlers depending on the floor type so try to use this kind of a floor only for large stockpiles. This way you will save up on wood for other tasks and needs. As for improving the aesthetics of the village, 
Adding your own three seedlings, one at a time, spread around the buildings, is a simple but effective way. Extra banners, torches and wall hangings are also a nice touch, which doesn't cost much in time or resources. A recurring theme in these playthroughs are buildings which are all open from spring to autumn, but in winter, when temperature plummets and cold snaps happen, you start to see how important it is for buildings to be enclosed to keep that heat in. Villagers who have to walk between buildings in winter will get cold quite quickly and can even get hypothermia. So before you hit your first cold snap, you need to plan for the life of the villagers during those coldest days indoors or provide them with enclosed spaces to move from building to building without going out into the freezing cold. Frostbite and hypothermia leave permanent debuffs to villagers' health and stats. Braziers help here along with thick walls with materials like clay which have high insulation for buildings above ground. This is the reason why an underground village makes it easier to survive extreme temperatures. Dirt, natural pillars provide the best insulation and the depth prevents temperature changes. I am not going to try and tell you which village design is best because each one has its strengths and shortcomings. What I prefer are less aesthetically pleasing but more efficient designs especially room designs and placement where you can save time by having everything close by and next to each other, like stockpiles right at the foot of workbenches and tables with chairs in food basements. Not pretty, sure, but works out quite well and saves a lot of time. Of course, there are several more specialized rooms I have yet to showcase to you. A tip about these is that by pressing the default V key, we'll open up a small UI bar to the left where if you hover your mouse over any of the colors, you can read which rooms need what items in them to become specialized. My next videos about village designs will focus more on a singular game mode and because of that different topics. A peaceful mode video will be more about room design and aesthetics, while the survival mode video will be about defensive structures, traps, directing enemies and so on. If you have any suggestions or advice for other players, feel free to write in the comments. I want to thank you for supporting my channel and watching my videos. I wish you all happy gaming.